had to look up our hymn that we sang a little while ago, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. I was wondering who the composer was, who the writer was of the hymn, so I was looking it up. And uh, it, you know, it's one that, that Dan stopped us and made us ponder about the words of the hymn. Yeah. Uh, it was written, it's an old German hymn written by, I'm probably going to butcher this, y'all help me out a little bit. Jo Joachim Neander, I believe is how you would say his name. He lived in, from 1650 to 1680. That means that in 30 years, uh, at some point, he wrote this hymn. I don't even consider myself to be an adult by the time I was 30. And yet, here's this man who wrote this beautiful, he put beautiful words to pen and paper uh, for us to sing. What a good song that was. It was uh, written by him in the 1600s, put to music also in the 1600s, and then it was harmonized in the 1800s. And that song has stood the test of time, written by what I would say as a child. Because uh, I was definitely not mature enough to write something as beautiful as that when I was uh, in my younger years. It wasn't until I got married and married to straighten me out that I matured up to the <laughs> Well, uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Exodus chapter 2. Uh, we're going to move on to the next phase of the life of Moses. And, uh, things, will, things will start to stick, pick up speed here very, very soon. But right now, we are uh, moving through a lot of the, the chapters of Moses' life. And we're only in chapter 2 of the book of Exodus. I titled this, this message tonight, Never Get Ahead of God and His Plans. Uh, that's exactly what Moses was attempting to do. And we'll see that play out right here in the, in the first set of verses. In uh, verses 11 through 15, we see that Moses tries to help, but fails. Uh, Moses wants to help God out. How many of you have ever had that thought in your head? Well, I'll just help God out. Yeah. Uh, well, as we see here with Moses, when we try to help God, we fail as well. Look at verse 11. Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their herds. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two Hebrew men were fighting. And he said to the one who, was, who did the wrong, Why are you striking your companion? Then he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and sat, back, sat down by a well. Well, if you were here last Sunday evening, we read verses 1 through 10 of chapter 2. And uh, from where we left off last Sunday night in verse 10 to now in verse 11, where it says there, Now it came to pass in those days. That now it came to pass represents... 40 years. So, what we left off last week was Moses was, was a, a being adopted into the family of Pharaoh. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter has now accepted him and embraced him, brought him into the family where he was taught and trained. And now, 40 years later, it says there that he is going to go out for a stroll. So, the first thing we see there is that Moses went out the first day. Uh, the first day. Now, what day that was, I don't know. Uh, no special occasion. He just happened to go out and ponder what was taking place. I'm use your word here. <laughs> as we see there, as he goes out the first day, Moses has compassion for his kin. Those that were of his blood relation. Uh, Moses, no doubt, knew that he was a Jew. Uh, he, he lived with his mom long enough to know that uh, he was of the line of, of the Jews and he was adopted into Pharaoh's family. And so he had compassion as he sees the Egyptian soldiers 
beating his kinfolk, those that he knew that he was blood related to, as we see there in verse 11. So, what does Moses do? Moses kills <coughs> there in verse 12. He commits murder. Not only is it murder, it's not just an act of anger or rage at a moment. It is premeditated. It says there that he looked this way and he looked that way. He was checking out to see what was going on because he knew what he was about to do. This was premeditated murder on the, the hands of Moses. Then, to top it off, not only does he look this way, he looked that way to see how he get away with doing so, then he tries to cover his evidence. And he, he goes and drags his body into the, 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 the sand, wherever it might be, whether it's hidden or hit by covering the light or whatever. He, uh, he made sure he tried to cover his tracks and he buried the body into the sand so that no one would find out. At this point, Moses is living by sight and not by faith. Now we're told all the time to, to not do that. Live by faith and not by sight. But Moses sees something, sees something that he doesn't like, and he wants to take matter into his own hands. Now we do this all the time. We, we, we see uh, what we want for our own future. We see what we like, what we don't like, and we try to take matter into our own hands all the time. That is living by sight and not by faith. So that leads us to verse 13, where we see that Moses went out on the second day. Uh, one day has passed, maybe, maybe a couple days has passed, but more yet, as we read there, he went out the second day, the, the next day, and, and Moses has compassion for his kin yet again. Uh, he sees now two of his relatives, uh, probably not close enough to call them by name, but they, they are of the bloodline. They are Jews as well. And he has compassion on them. He says, why are you fighting? Why, why are you doing this? It's kind of like what a parent does with, with their two children who are fighting over a toy. What are you doing? Don't go fight. You're going to break it. Uh, and Moses is saying, why? Why are you fighting? You are the, the same family. You should love one another. You should have compassion for one, one another. And that's what Moses is, is attempting to do. Attempting to be the, the big brother to come in and rescue stop the fighting between these two relatives. And we see in verse 14, Moses is confronted. Here, Moses is now pulled out, called on the carpet. Uh, they confront him and say, are you going to do to us what you did to the Egyptians? Well, I, I think this relates very well to our, our society today. Moses can't believe that he was caught. He can't believe that anybody saw what he did. But you know what? There is not much that you can do nowadays that isn't seen by somebody. I mean, in this day and age, everybody has one of these little smartphones right here. You know, uh, uh, these phones, they take pictures, they access the internet, get on social media, they can text, they can do all that, they can even make phone calls. <laughs> they, these things are incredible what they do, and if you notice, there are people recording all the time. There are videos and pictures of, of anything and everything. In fact, our services have been recorded live, and they go on Facebook, and uh, uh, Wayne was sharing with me this morning. How many times was uh, the, the, the live Facebook feed viewed last Sunday? Over 300. Yeah, over 300 times, just from having a live feed that we have for our service. And then Ricky does an edited version that's a lot more abbreviated and, and uh, he, he, uh, he polishes me up and makes me look a whole lot better than I really am. Uh, but we have an edited version that goes out and, uh, and uh, look, you can't do anything that's not being recorded by somebody. You go to a, a ball game, people are recording not only the players in the field, they're recording people in the stands. And they're, the news often, often has amateur video footage by somebody's cell phone. There is nothing that isn't being recorded. Meredith told me this afternoon when she was coming home with the kids, I stayed at church for a meeting and she took the kids to lunch and then they went and, and did some shopping and then on their way home, she noticed that somebody was driving through our subdivision, driving very slow and taking pictures of the house, of the houses, I guess you should say. Now, he's probably an appraiser. Uh, there's a couple of houses for sale. He's probably just getting comps. I mean, that, that, that happens. But, here's somebody, we don't know who they are, they're driving through, and fortunately she got the license plate number, uh, my, my little uh, detective back there, uh, but 
He was taking pictures or videos or something of, of, of houses in the subdivision. Stuff like that goes on all the time. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing that you can do that isn't being observed by somebody. If you don't want to get caught doing something you shouldn't be doing, then don't do it. Right. It is just that simple. Because otherwise, you are going to get caught. But Moses was not uh, convicted from his sins. He was just caught. And there's a big difference. If you were here this morning, and I know most of you were, there's a difference between uh, that, that heartfelt repentance. It's not in being caught. It's not in being sorry or remorseful. It's not in having a desire to change. It's actually following through with it. And here we see that, that Moses is just caught in his sin. Moses is now being called out on the carpet. But I want to take you over to Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 24 through 26. And, and, they, and the author of Hebrews makes mention of this actual incident right here. It says in Hebrews 11, 24, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, this was 40 years later, and now as it has passed, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. In other words, Moses did not want what he had in the palace. He saw the, the, the Israelites, whether they were fighting or not, whether they were being tortured by the, the Egyptians or not, he wanted to be with them. He knew that they were God's people, but he wanted to be with God's people. Vance Hadden, the great preacher, once said, Moses saw the invisible, shows the imperishable, and did the impossible. Moses put his hope in his living God and surrounded himself with God's people and did what was necessary. Now, again, he should have waited on God. He should have let God take his revenge and not take matters into his own hands. Because what we see next is Moses went out the... What happened next? Third day. Third day. Thank you. Moses went out the third day. What we see is that Pharaoh wants to kill Moses yet again. In chapter 1, Moses wanted, or Pharaoh wanted to kill Moses all because he was a newborn Jewish boy. And Moses wanted to kill him, not because he knew his name, not because of what he had done, just because Pharaoh did not value life as God does, and as we should. And so Pharaoh wanted to kill Moses then, now he wants to kill him yet again. And now for the crimes that he has done. Uh, this time he is not innocent. He has blood on his hands. And so what does Moses do? He flees. He flees the scene to escape. And we're going to see in the weeks to come that Moses would prefer to flee from God as well as the children of Israel. Uh, he, he's, he is a runner. He's fleeing from Pharaoh at this time. He would rather flee from God. He would rather flee from the children of Israel and just hide. He is a probably an introvert. He is more of a homebody. He is not somebody that, that you would picture by nature would be called to the task that God is going to put him in. But that shows you that when we are weak, he is made strong. God takes us in our weakness, and he does incredible things. He took Moses out of his comfort zone and did extraordinary things through him. Well, in this section of verses, Moses has now run ahead of God. God wanted to use Moses in a mighty way to deliver his people, but because Moses attempted to, to take matters into his own hands, he had to run out of Egypt. Folks, we should never get ahead of God. Never get ahead of his perfect timing. I know we live in a a, a, a microwave society, but God operates in a crock pot. He, he, he wants things to simmer. He wants things to, to, to grow and to percolate and, he, and be so much better. I mean, I would much better rather have a meal that Meredith has cooked in a crock pot than to go home and have a TV dinner from a microwave. <coughs> but yet we want things right here, right now. We live in an instant society. And sometimes we try to take matters into our own hands. 
We try to do things that we think are right, and we're going to help God out by doing it right now. When God's saying, just wait, wait on me, and let me take care of it. But because Moses got ahead of God, God had to set him aside and place him in the wilderness for further training. Now, the wilderness is not a bad place. In fact, our ladies are, are doing a Bible study on Wednesday nights. If you don't have a, a place to come on Wednesday nights and you're a lady, I encourage you to go to the class that they have on the wilderness and how God uses the wilderness to prepare us and how He makes Himself seen even in that time of wandering in the wilderness. John the Baptist was in the wilderness. Jesus Christ went into the wilderness. The children had, of Israel had to wander through the wilderness. Moses is now being sent into the wilderness for further training. Because he tried to do things his way instead of God's way, God had to say, wait a minute, uh, you, need, you need some further training from me. So, we see that Moses tries to help and fails. But, as we move into verse 16, Moses tries to help, and this time, he succeeds. God wants to use you. God wants you to do things uh, to, to further the message of Christ, to, to do things that bring you glory and honor. God wants you to, to help, not because He needs your help, but He chooses to use you. But if you do it God's way, it will be successful. When we do it our way, that's when we fail. So now look at verse 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and helped them and watered the flock. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, How is it that you have come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And he also drew enough water for us to, uh, and watered the flock. So he said to his daughters, And where is he? Why is it you left this man? Call him that he may eat bread. Then Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zipporah his wife to Moses. Or oh, I'm sorry. He gave Zipporah his daughter to Moses. It's not his wife, it's going to be Moses' wife. <laughs> and she bore him a son and called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, and with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. So instead of running, or instead of fleeing as he did previously, this time Moses stands up. He's going to stand up and do what's right, the honorable, noble, Thing. We see in verses uh, 16 and 17. Uh, the, the Midianites, this family that he rescues, they were also descendants of Abraham, uh, but they were from, from a, a slave or a concubine. Uh, they were not uh, of Sarah's line, and so they were uh, 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 different. They, they, yes, they came from Abraham, but they were different. They were of different skin color, different nationality, different uh, 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 religious background, different all kinds of things. But yet they were still related one way or another. And so he stands up to help out these, these daughters and to make sure that they are not mistreated, that their livestock is not mistreated. And so, yes, he, he ran from Pharaoh, he ran from his relatives there in Egypt, Jews that confront him, but he's not running this time. He stands up to be a, a gentleman to fight for all these ladies. Yet again, Moses is being sought out. But instead of being sought out by Pharaoh who wanted to kill him, this time it's by Ruel. He sought to reward him. He wanted to bless Moses for what he did for his daughters. Ruel is also known as Jethro. That's what he will be known as throughout the remainder of Exodus. Uh, he was the priest of Midian. Now, I just told you that the Midianites, they were of the descendants of Abraham, but they were different. That they had different skin color, different uh, uh, practices, different probably taste buds. 
there was different in all kinds of ways. Uh, they also had uh, different gods. They didn't worship the one true God. But as descendants of Abraham, there is the very good possibility that the worship of the one true God had been passed down. And it is very possible that Jethro, Ruel here, the priest of Midian, could have been a priest of the one true God. He could have been a worshiper of the God, Jehovah, God Yahweh. We don't know, and there are some question marks. I guarantee you, if you ask a hundred theologians this question, you'll get a hundred and two different answers. Because no one truly knows, but there is the possibility that Jethro was a worshiper of Yahweh. Interestingly, in this part of the story, though, his daughter, when they come and report to him of what just transpired, they say uh, an Egyptian has helped us, not a Jew. Moses would have had the characteristics of a Jew. Uh, they would have shown him, recognize him by his skin tone, by maybe his, his physical features, but they called him an Egyptian. How sad it is when God's children look more like the world than they do as Christians. And not necessarily in appearance, but definitely when it comes to spiritual matters and in our actions. How we talk, the things that we do, the places we go, the people we associate with. Folks, we are called out to be different. We're to be set apart. And if the world can't tell a difference between you and them, then you're not living for Christ. Now, I'm not telling you to look down your nose at anybody. I'm not telling you to have a pious look and, and be better or holier than thou. But I am saying that you need to be different. I am saying that you are a child of God. Act like it. When we move into verse 21, we see that Moses settles down with his new bride, Zipporah. They get married as part of his... Uh, as he is moving to the, the household of Ruel or Jethro, uh, he gives him his daughter Zipporah. They become a family, and we see that she gives him a son, and they name him Gershom. Now, not much, not a whole lot is mentioned throughout the book of Exodus about Moses' family. And I find that very strange. You know, apart from our relationship with God, the second most important thing in our lives needs to be our family. Uh, a spouse, if God gives it to you. Children, if God gives that to you. But our family has a, a special place and priority. And it's odd that Moses, who wrote the Pentateuch, spent very little time writing about his family, and his relationship with his wife and his sons. Um, if, if you continue to come on Sunday nights, I have a theory about this, and I want you to be here for that. Uh, we'll see about Moses the dad when it comes to his relationship with the children and with his wife. Now, many scholars will tell us that just as in verse 11, or from verse 10 to 11, 40 years passed, they will now tell us that in verse, uh, between verses 22 and 23, that 40 years passes again. It says there uh, in verse 22, And she bore him a son, and she named him Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Now where they get 40 years from, I don't really know. To be quite honest with you, I don't quite buy it. Uh, I think less time passed. I believe that when God sends uh, them back into Egypt, his sons are probably more like teenagers, maybe older teenagers. So there's no way, in my opinion, there's no way 40 years have passed. But if it had, when we get to that point, when we get to the part of the story that God, that Moses and his family are now going back into Egypt, it's going to shed a whole lot of light to the story. But in my opinion, uh, probably 10, 15, 20 years have passed since uh, between verses 22 and 23. So regardless of the amount, amount of time, regardless of whether it was 10 years or 100 years, it, that does not matter. Because our point D is that time heals some wounds. You've probably heard that saying before, right? Time heals wounds. Well, it heals some wounds.
was not all. Tom did take care of Pharaoh, the very one who was out to kill Moses, one to put him to death, who sought after him to, to punish him. He's now dead. Uh, I've heard, heard pastors say all the time that they're at a, at a church uh, where they, they're constantly under ridicule. Fortunately, I haven't had that here. In my six months, y'all haven't ridiculed me too much yet. Uh, but I know, I know a lot of pastors who say, man, if I can just outlive old so-and-so, <laughs> things will be a whole lot better. Well, in Moses' case, he was not able to outlive the Pharaoh who wanted to put him to death. And so Tom did heal that wound. However, Tom did not heal the wound of the Israelites. They're now being disciplined by the Egyptians even more. They're being punished even more. But what we got to realize, though, is no matter how much time has passed, 10 years, 15 years, 40 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years, God remembers His promises. He remembered His promises to Abraham. He told Abraham in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, He promised Abraham that He would build up a great nation and that this, they, would, they would dwell in this land. He promised Isaac in Genesis 26. He promised Jacob in Genesis 28 and Genesis 35. God remembers His promises. God has promised us that His Son will return. God has promised us that, that everything will out. He gives us the, 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 the playbook, tells us about the rapture of the church, about uh, the, the, the great tribulation that's still to come, about the, the second coming of Christ, the millennial reign, and the eternity that to come, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. All of that is played out for us. It is promised to us. God will not forget His promise. Yes, that promise was written by the, the disciple John many, many, many years ago. Probably A.D. 80. So we're looking at almost 2,000 years ago that God has not forgotten one word of that promise. And it will come to pass. His Son is going to return. Are you ready? Are you living in such a way that if, if He parted the clouds tonight, and we met him in the air. Would you be prepared for that day? First of all, do you know without a shadow of a doubt you're saved? Do you know that if you were to return, you would be one of the children that he would call? He'd call you by name, and you would be his. You have that assurance. If not, then this invitation is your opportunity to be right with God to so become his child. Secondly, if you are his child, and he were to return this very evening, would you be glad? Would you be glad to stand before Him? Would you be ready to stand at the beam of seat and say, I did everything I possibly could? Or would you stand there ashamed, knowing that you never lived up to your potential? You never did what God wanted you to do. Maybe you were running ahead of Him, trying to do things in your own way, instead of waiting on God. Folks, whether He returns tonight, or He's still got another thousand years to go before He returns, all I know is He is coming. We need to be ready. Our Heavenly Father, we will thank You for the promise You have given to us. God, I pray that we are faithfully attempting to give You our very best. And we are ready and prepared for Your coming. God, I pray that we learn from the example set before us, both good and bad, just in this one set of verses, Moses shows us a bad example, and he shows us a good example. Well, I pray we learn. We learn from the good and the bad, so we can give you our very best. I pray that you can move during our time of invitation and draw us to you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.